In chapter 7, we will discuss the types of evidence decisions auditors make, the evidence available to auditors, and the use of that evidence in performing audits and documenting those audit results. At the end of chapter 7, you should be able to do the following. You should be able to contrast audit evidence with evidence used by other professions, be able to identify the four audit evidence decisions that are needed to create an audit program, specify the characteristics that determine the persuasiveness of evidence, be able to identify and apply the eight types of evidence used in auditing, know the types of analytical procedures and their purpose, be able to compute common financial ratios, understand the purpose of audit documentation, and lastly, be able to prepare organized audit documentation. In Chapter 1, evidence was defined as any information used by the auditor to determine whether the information being audited is stated in accordance with the established criteria. We will begin this chapter by discussing the difference in evidence used by the auditor versus the evidence used by other professionals. The use of evidence is not unique to auditors. Evidence is also used extensively by scientists, lawyers, and historians. In here, we have an illustration of the six characteristics of evidence from the perspective of a scientist doing an experiment, an attorney prosecuting a thief, and an auditor of financial statements. As you can see, there are six bases of comparison used in this illustration. First is the use of the evidence, the nature of the evidence used, the party or parties evaluating the evidence, the certainty of conclusions from the evidence, the nature of conclusions, and lastly, the consequences of incorrect conclusions from the evidence. Please read Table 7-1 and notice the similarities and differences among the three professions illustrated in the table. You can find Table 7-1 on page 180 of your textbook. A major decision facing every auditor is determining the appropriate types and amounts of evidence needed to be satisfied that the client's financial statements are fairly stated. In our next discussion, we will cover the four audit evidence decisions that are needed to create an audit program. There are four major decisions the auditor must make regarding what evidence to gather and how much to accumulate. These decisions are which audit procedures to use, what sample size to select for a given procedure, which items to select from the population, and when to perform the procedures. An audit procedure is the detailed instruction that explains the audit evidence to be obtained during the audit. An example of an audit procedure would be to examine the cash disbursement journal in the accounting system and then compare the payee name, amount, and date with 
the online information provided by the bank about checks and electronic transfers process for that particular account. Once an audit procedure is selected, the decision of how many items to test for a sample must be made by the auditor for each audit procedure. For example, in an audit procedure to verify cash disbursements journal, the auditor might select a sample size of 50 disbursements for comparison with the cash disbursement journal. Do keep in mind that auditors can vary the sample size from one to all the items in the population being tested and the sample size for any given procedure is likely to vary from audit to audit. After the sample size for an audit procedure has been determined, the auditor then must decide which items in the population to test. For example, in an audit procedure to verify cash disbursement journal, the auditor can select 50 disbursements with the largest amounts, or the auditor would select the items randomly. There are several different methods the auditor can use to select specific items to be examined or to use for testing. An audit usually covers a period in which the audit will be performed and completed. Um, this pertains to when does the auditor perform the audit procedures. The timing decision is affected by when the client needs the audit to be completed. For public companies, the Security Exchange Commission currently requires that all public companies file audited financial statements with the Security Exchange Commission within 60, to, within 60 to 90 days of the company's fiscal year end. And that will depend on the company's actual size. However, timing is also influenced by when the auditor believes the audit evidence will be most effective and when audit staff is actually available to perform the audit procedures. For example, the auditors often prefer to do counts of inventory as close to the balance sheet date as possible. Audit procedures often incorporate sample size, items to select, and timing into the procedure. The list of audit procedures for an audit area or an entire audit is called an audit program. Moving on, we will now discuss the persuasiveness of audit evidence. Auditing standards require that the auditor accumulate sufficient appropriate evidence to support the opinion issued for the financial statements. However, the auditor must be persuaded that the opinion issued is correct with a high level of assurance. By combining all evidence from the entire audit, the auditor is then able to decide when he or she is persuaded to issue an audit report. The two determinants of the persuasiveness of evidence are appropriateness and sufficiency. Appropriateness of evidence is a measure of the quality of evidence, meaning its relevance and reliability in meeting the audit objectives for the classes of transactions, account balances, and related disclosures. Relevance of evidence means that the evidence must pertain to or be relevant to the audit objective that is being tested. For example, assume that the auditor is concerned that a client is failing to bill customers for shipments. Uh, 
and the audit objective is to test for completeness of transaction where each shipment was billed to customers. A relevant procedure for this example is to trace a sample of shipping documents to the related duplicate sales invoices to determine whether each shipment was billed to each customer. By tracing from shipping documents to duplicate sales invoices, the auditor can then determine whether shipments have been billed to the company's customers. This procedure is relevant because the shipment of goods is the normal criterion used for determining whether a sale has occurred and should have been billed. In contrast, reliability of evidence refers to the degree to which evidence is believable or worthy of trust. Reliability depends on the following characteristics. The independence of the provider of the evidence, such as a source outside the entity, is considered more reliable than that obtained from within the client's company. The effectiveness of the client's internal controls. The auditor's direct knowledge through physical examination, observation, recalculation, and inspection. Uh, the qualification of individuals providing the information, the degree of objectivity related to the audit evidence, and the timeliness of the audit evidence. For example, evidence is usually more reliable for balance sheet accounts when it is obtained as close to the balance sheet date as possible. Sufficiency of evidence refers to the quantity of evidence obtained. Sufficiency of evidence is measured primarily by the sample size the auditor selects. Several factors determine the appropriate sample size in audits. The two most important factors are the auditor's expectation of misstatements and the effectiveness of the client's internal controls. Samples containing population items with large dollar values, items with a high likelihood of misstatement, and items that are representative of the population are usually considered sufficient. The persuasiveness of the evidence can be evaluated only after considering the combination of appropriateness and sufficiency, including the effects of the factors influencing both. In making decisions about audit evidence, both persuasiveness and cost must be considered by the auditor. The persuasiveness and cost of all alternatives should be considered before selecting the best type or types of evidence. However, the cost is never an adequate justification for omitting a necessary procedure or not gathering an adequate sample size. In here, we have an illustration of the relationships among the four evidence decisions and the two qualities that determine the persuasiveness of evidence. To illustrate these relationships, assume an auditor is verifying inventory that is a major item in the financial statements. And auditing standards require that the auditor be reasonably persuaded that inventory is not materially misstated. The auditor then must obtain a sufficient amount of relevant and reliable evidence about inventory. This means deciding which procedures to use for auditing inventory, as well as determining the sample size and items to select from the population to satisfy the, su the sufficiency requirements.
the combination of these four evidence decisions must result in sufficient persuasive evidence to satisfy the auditor that inventory is materially correct. You can find Table 7-2 on page 184 of your textbook. In deciding which audit procedures to use, the auditor can choose from eight types of evidence. We will now discuss the eight types of evidence used in auditing. Every audit procedure obtains one or more of the following types of evidence. Physical examination, confirmation, inspection, analytical procedures, inquiries of the client, recalculation, reperformance, and observation. In here, we have a diagram that shows relationships among auditing standards, the types of evidence, and the four audit evidence decisions. Auditing standards provide general guidance in three categories. These are qualifications and conduct, reporting, and evidence accumulation. The types of evidence are broad categories of the evidence that can be accumulated. We will cover the types of evidence in the next slide. Audit procedures include the four evidence decisions, which are sample size, items to select for testing, timing of testing, and what procedures to use. Please read figure 7-1 as it is a good summary of the topics previously discussed in this chapter. You can find figure 7-1 on page 185 of your textbook. Physical examination is the inspection or count by the auditor of a tangible asset. This type of evidence is most often associated with inventory and cash, but it is also applicable to the verification of securities, notes receivable, and tangible fixed assets. Physical examination is a direct means of verifying that an asset actually exists. It is an objective means of ascertaining both the quantity and the description of the asset, and in some cases is a method for evaluating an asset's condition or quality. Physical examination is also considered one of the most reliable and useful type of audit evidence. Confirmation describes the receipt of a direct written response from a third party verifying the accuracy of information that was requested by the auditor. The request is usually made to the client and the client will ask the third party to respond directly to the auditor. U.S. auditing standards require the confirmation of a sample of accounts receivable when it is practical and reasonable to do so. This requirement exists because accounts receivable usually represent a significant balance on the financial statements, and confirmations are a highly reliable type of evidence. Please take note that the international auditing standards does not require confirmation of accounts receivable. Only the U.S. auditing standards require accounts receivable confirmation. Inspection is the auditor's examination of the client's documents and records to substantiate the information that is or should be included in the financial statements.
the documents examined by the auditor are the records used by the client to provide information for conducting its business. Documents can be classified as internal and external to the client. An internal document is a document that has been prepared and used within the client's organization and is retained without ever going to an outside party. Examples of internal documents include duplicate sales invoices, employees time reporting, and inventory receiving reports. In contrast, uh, an external document is a document that has been handled by someone outside the client's organization who is a party to the transaction being documented. Examples of exter external documents include a vendor's invoices, canceled notes payable, and insurance policies. Internal documents created and processed under conditions of effective internal controls are more reliable than internal documents created and processed under conditions of deficient internal controls. When auditors use documentation to support recorded transactions or amounts, the process is often called vouching. Vouching satisfies the occurrence objective. For example, an auditor verifies entries in the acquisitions journal by examining supporting vendors' invoices and receiving reports, thereby satisfying the auditor's objective of verifying the, the occurrence of the purchase. In contrast, if the auditor traces from receiving reports to the acquisitions journal to satisfy the completeness objective, this process is called tracing. Tracing involves testing from the source documents to the recorded amounts. Although confirmation is currently not required for any account other than accounts receivable, this type of evidence is useful in verifying many types of information. In here, we have the major types of information that are often confirmed in an audit along with the source of the confirmation. For example, an auditor would like to verify the accuracy of the cash surrender value of a life insurance policy. The source of the confirmation in this particular example would be the insurance company. Please read Table 7-3. Uh, you can find this table on page 187 of your textbook. Another type of evidence used by an auditor is analytical procedures. Analytical procedures are defined by auditing standards as evaluations of financial information through analysis of plausible relationships among financial and non-financial data. For example, an auditor may compare the gross margin percent in the current year with the preceding year's gross margin. Analytical procedures are used extensively in practice and are required during the planning and completion phases on all audits. The purpose of analytical procedures during the planning phase of the audit is to understand the client's industry and business. The auditor uses analytical procedures to gain knowledge about the client. For example, the auditor conducts analytical procedures by comparing current year's unaudited information of fixed assets with the prior year's audited information. If the result of the analytical procedures show an increase in the balance in fixed assets, the auditor may consider including in the planning 
a review of significant acquisitions of fixed assets. Another purpose of using analytical procedures is to assess the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. It is a useful indicator for determining whether the client company has financial problems. For example, if a higher than normal ratio of the client's company's long-term debt to net worth is combined with a lower than average ratio of profits to total assets, uh, a relatively high risk of financial failure may be indicated. Such condition will affect the planning of the audit. Analytical procedures can also provide the auditor an indication of the presence of possible misstatements in the financial statements. The presence of unusual fluctuations noted in comparing current and prior year information could signal the presence of accounting misstatements. Unusual fluctuation is the significant unexpected differences between the current year's and audited financial data and other information used in comparisons. In many cases, uh, an analytical procedure can be used to provide evidence supporting recorded account balances. If reliable relationships exist, Substantive analytical procedures can be used to support account balances. Analytical procedures used as substantive evidence to support an account balance are called substantive analytical procedures. Inquiry is a type of evidence where written or oral information is obtained from the client in response to questions from the auditor. It usually cannot be regarded as conclusive because it is not from an independent source and may be biased in the client's favor. Therefore, it is normally necessary for the auditor to obtain corroborating evidence through other procedures. Corroborating evidence is additional evidence to support the original evidence. Recalculation is a type of evidence that involves rechecking a sample of calculations made by the client. Reperformance is a type of evidence that involves the auditor's test of client accounting procedures or controls. For example, an auditor may compare the price on an invoice to an approved price list or the auditor may reperform the aging of accounts receivable. Observation is a type of evidence that consists of looking at a process or procedure being performed by others. Observation provides evidence about the performance of a process or procedure, but it is limited to the point in time at which the observation takes place. For example, an auditor may watch individuals perform accounting tasks to determine whether the person assigned the responsibility is performing it properly. Please note that observation is rarely sufficient evidence by itself because of the risk of client personnel changing their behavior because of the auditor's presence. However, observation is useful in evaluating the effectiveness of client procedures in counting inventory. As discussed earlier in the previous slides, the characteristics for determining the appropriateness of evidence are relevance and reliability. In here we have table 7-4 that illustrates the appropriateness of the types of evidence. The table includes the eight types of evidence related to five 
of the six criteria that determines reliability of evidence. Note that two of the characteristics that determine the appropriateness of evidence, which are relevance and timeliness, are not included in this table. Each of the eight types of evidence included in the table has the potential to be both relevant and timely, depending on its source and when the evidence is obtained. Several observations are apparent from studying the table. First, the effectiveness of a client's internal controls has significant influence on the reliability of most types of audit evidence, especially internal documentation and analytical procedures. Second, both physical examination and recalculation are likely to be highly reliable if the internal controls are effective, but their use differs considerably. This effectively illustrates that two completely different types of evidence can be equally reliable. Third, inquiry alone is usually not sufficient to provide appropriate evidence to satisfy any audit objective. Please read Table 7-4. You can find Table 7-4 on page 190 of your textbook. The two most expensive types of evidence are physical examination and confirmation. Physical examination is expensive because it normally requires the auditor's presence and traveling to scattered geographical locations. Confirmation is also expensive because the auditor must follow careful procedures in the confirmation preparation, transmittal, receipt, and in the follow-up of non-responses and exceptions. In contrast, Inspection, analytical procedures, and reperformance are moderately costly procedures. The three least expensive type of evidence are observation, inquiries of the client, and recalculation. In here, we have a table of the definition for the several terms commonly used to describe audit procedures. An illustration of an audit procedure for each term and the type of evidence related to each. The first term is examine. Examination involves the detailed study of a record or document to determine specific facts about it. Uh, for example, an auditor would examine a sample of vendor's invoices to determine whether goods received are the type normally used by the client's business. Examination is associated with the type of evidence defined as inspection. A scan is a less detailed examination of a document to determine whether something is unusual warranting the auditor's further investigation. For example, the auditor would scan the sales journal for large and unusual transactions. Scanning is associated with the type of evidence defined as analytical procedures. Read involves an examination of written information to determine pertinent facts to the audit. For example, the auditor would read the minutes of a board of directors meeting. Reading is associated with the type of evidence defined as, as inspection. Compute involves the calculation done by the auditor. For example, the auditor would compute inventory turnover ratios and compare with those of previous years as a test of inventory obsolescence. Computing is associated with the type of evidence defined as analytical procedures. In contrast, recompute involves the calculation done by the auditor to 
determine if a client's calculation is correct. For example, an auditor would recompute the unit sales price times the number of units for a sample of duplicate sales invoices and then compare the total with the calculations. Recompute is associated with the type of evidence defined as recalculation. Footing involves the addition of a column of numbers to determine whether the total is the same as the clients. For example, the auditor would foot the sales journal for a one-month period and compare all totals with the general ledger. Footing is associated with the type of evidence defined as recalculation. Tracing is an instruction normally associated with inspection or reperformance. The instruction should state what the auditor is tracing and where it is being traced from and to. For example, an auditor would trace postings from the sales journal to the general ledger accounts. Tracing is associated with the type of evidence defined as inspection or reperformance. Compare involves a comparison of information in two different locations. For example, the auditor would select a sample of sales invoices and compare the unit selling price as stated on the invoice to the list of unit selling prices authorized by management. Compare is associated with the type of evidence defined as inspection. Accounting is a determination of assets on hand at a given time. For example, the auditor does a count of a sample of 100 inventory items and would compare quantity and description to the client's count. This term should be associated only with the type of evidence defined as physical examination. Observe is associated with the type of evidence defined as observation. For example, an auditor would observe whether the two inventory count teams independently, independently would count and record inventory counts. Inquire should be associated with the type of evidence defined as inquiry. For example, an auditor would inquire of management whether there is any obsolete inventory on hand at the balance sheet date. And lastly, vouching is the use of documents to verify recorded transactions or amounts. For example, an auditor would vouch a sample of recorded acquisition transactions to the vendor's invoices and receiving reports. Vouching is associated with the type of evidence defined as inspection. Please read Table 7-5. You can find this table on page 192 of your textbook. Analytical procedures are one of the eight types of evidence that we introduced earlier in the discussion. We will now move on and discuss the types of analytical procedures and their purpose. Analytical procedures may be performed at any of three times during an audit. First, and analytical procedures are required in the planning phase of the audit as part of risk assessment procedures to understand the client's business and industry, as well as assist in determining the nature, extent, and timing of audit procedures. Analytical procedures done in the planning phase typically use data aggregated at a high level such as using overall financial statement balances. Analytical procedures are also often done during the testing phase of the audit as a substantive test in support of account balances. These substantive analytical procedures 
are often done in conjunction with other audit procedures. When substantive analytical procedures are used during the testing phase of the audit, the auditing standards require the auditor to document in the working papers the auditor's expectation and factors considered in its development. The auditor is also required to evaluate the reliability of the data used to develop the expectation, including the source of the data and controls over the data's preparation. And lastly, analytical procedures are also required during the completion phase of the audit, serving as a final review for material misstatements or financial problems and to help the auditor take a final objective look at the audited financial statements. The usefulness of analytical procedures as audit, ed audit evidence depends significantly on appropriate comparison data. Uh, the auditor typically compares the client's balances and ratios with expected balances and ratios using one or more of the following types of analytical procedures. In each case, auditors compare client data with industry data, similar prior period data, client determined expected results, and auditor determined expected results. Industry data may provide useful information about the client's performance and potential misstatements. The most important benefits of industry comparisons are to aid in understanding the client's business and as an indication of the likelihood of financial failure. However, a major weakness in using industry ratios for auditing is the difference between the nature of the client's information and that of the firms making up the industry total. One approach to overcome the limitations of industry averages is to compare the client to one or more benchmark firms in the industry. A wide variety of analytical procedures allow auditors to compare client data with similar data from one or more prior periods. Some common examples are comparing of the current year's balance with that of the preceding year, comparing the detail of a total balance with similar detail for the preceding year, and lastly, computing ratios and percent relationships for comparison with previous years. Uh, for client-determined results, an example would be a company's preparation of budgets for various aspects of their operations and financial results. Because budgets represent the client's expectations for the period, the auditor should inves investigate the most significant differences between budgeted and actual results as these areas may contain potential misstatements. The absence of differences may indicate that misstatements are unlikely. Another common comparison of client data with expected results occur when the auditor calculates the expected balance for comparison with the actual balance. In this type of substantive analytical procedure, the auditor develops an expectation of what an account balance should be by relating it to some other balance sheet or income statement account or accounts or by making projection based on non-financial data or some historical trend. In here, we have a few ratios and internal comparisons to show the widespread use of ratio analysis. In all these cases, the comparison should be made with calculations made in previous years for the same client. Many of the ratios and percents used for comparison with previous years 
are the same ones used for comparison with industry data. For example, the auditor often compares current year gross margin with industry averages as well as margins for previous years. Uh, the auditor could also use a ratio such as sales commission divided by net sales to identify misstatement of sales commissions. Or the auditor would use each of the individual manufacturing expenses as a percent of total manufacturing expense to identify significant misstatement of individual expenses within a total. Uh, please read table 7-6. You can find this table on page 195 of your textbook. In here, we have an illustration of how the auditor may make an independent calculation of interest expense on notes payable by multiplying the average ending balances and interest rates for both short-term and long-term notes payable as a substantive test of the reasonableness of recorded interest expense. And notice how the auditor's substantive analytical procedure begins with the development of the auditor's expectation of interest expense for short-term notes payable and then combines that with the auditor's calculation of an estimated interest expense for long-term notes payable to arrive at the expected amount of total interest expense of 2399315 Because of the fluctuating nature of the short-term notes payable balance from month to month, the auditor's calculation of a 12-month average balance and average interest rate generates a more precise estimate of expected interest expense. Less precision is needed for long-term notes payable given the constant rate of interest across the year and the stable nature of the balance outstanding. This working paper also effectively documents the auditor's expectation that is required by auditing standards for substantive analytical procedures. You can find figure 6-2 on page 197 of your textbook. Auditors' analytical procedures often include the use of general financial ratios during planning and final review of the audited financial statements. Uh, moving on, we will now discuss the common financial ratios used in auditing. Financial ratios are useful for understanding recent events and the financial status of the business and for viewing the statements from the perspective of a user. Ratios and other analytical procedures are normally calculated using spreadsheets and other types of audit software. Financial ratios fall into several categories. Auditors normally use the cash ratio, the quick ratio, and the current ratio in determining a client's short-term debt paying ability. Companies need a reasonable level of liquidity to pay their debts as they come due and these three ra ratios measure the company's liquidity. The cash ratio is useful in evaluating the client's ability to pay debts immediately whereas the current ratio requires the conversion of assets such as inventory and accounts receivable to cash before debts can be paid. The most important difference between the quick and current ratio is the inclusion of inventory in current assets for the current ratio. In order to determine the client's liquidity, uh, the auditor will use the accounts receivable turnover, the days to collect receivables, the inventory turnover, 
and the days to sell inventory. If a company does not have sufficient cash and cash-like items to meet its obligations, the key to its debt-paying ability is the time it takes the company to convert less liquid current assets into cash. This is measured by the liquidity activity ratios. Uh, you can find the formula and examples for calculating the short-term debt paying ability and liquidity activity ratios on page 196 and page 198 of your textbook. To determine a client's ability to meet long-term debt obligations, the auditor will use the debt to equity ratio and the times interest earned ratio. The auditor will also use earnings per share, gross profit percentage, profit margin, return on assets, and return on common equity to determine a client's profitability. The debt to equity ratio shows the extent of the use of debt in financing a company. The times interest earned ratio shows whether the company can comfortably make its interest payments, assuming that earnings trends are stable. A company's ability to generate cash for payment of obligations, expansion, and dividends is heavily dependent on profitability. Uh, the most widely used profitability ratio is earnings per share. Uh, gross profit percentage shows the portion of sales available to cover all expenses and profit after deducting the cost of the product. Now, auditors find this ratio especially useful for assessing misstatements in sales, cost of goods sold, accounts receivable, and inventory. Now, profit margin enables the auditor to assess potential misstatements in operating expenses, and related balance sheet accounts. Return on assets and return on common equity are measures of overall profitability of a company. These ratios show a company's ability to generate profit for each dollar of assets and equity. You can find the formula and examples for calculating the ability to meet long-term debt obligations and the profitability ratios on page 198 and page 199 of your textbook. Moving on, we will now discuss about documenting the procedures, evidence, and conclusions of an audit. Auditing standards state that audit documentation is the record of the audit procedures performed, relevant audit evidence, and conclusions the auditor reached. Audit documentation may also be referred to as working papers or work papers, although audit documentation is usually maintained in computerized files. The objective of audit documentation is to provide basis for planning the audit, to record the evidence accumulated, and the results of the test, um, the source of data for determining the proper type of audit report, and the basis for review by supervisors and partners. Now, audit documentation prepared during the audit including schedules prepared by the client for the auditor, is the property of the auditor. At the completion of the audit, audit files are retained on the certified public accountant's premises for future reference and to comply with auditing standards related to document retention. The need to maintain a confidential relationship with the client is expressed in the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct, which states that 
a member in public practice shall not disclose any confidential client information without the specific consent of the client. Auditing standards also require that records for audits for private companies be retained for a minimum of five years. The Surveillance-Oxley Act requires auditors of public companies to maintain audit files for a minimum of seven years. The law makes the knowing and willful destruction of audit documentation within the seven-year period a criminal offense subject to financial fines and imprisonment up to 10 years. Each certified public accounting firm establishes its own approach to preparing and organizing audit files and the beginning auditor must adapt to the firm's approach. Your textbook emphasizes the general concepts common to all audit documentation. Permanent files contain data of a historical or continuing nature pertinent to the current period. These files provide a convenient source of information about the audit that is used from year to year. The permanent file also typically include the copies of company documents such as articles of incorporation, bylaws, and bond indentures as well as long-term contracts. It also includes the analysis of accounts from previous years that have continuing importance to the auditor. Also included in the permanent file are information related to understanding internal controls and assessing control risks and the results of analytical procedures from prior years audit to comparisons made. In here, we have an illustration of the contents and organization of a typical set of audit files. They contain virtually everything involved in the audit. In this figure, the audit files include general information such as corporate data in the permanent files, in addition to current files that contain documentation of the auditor's test, the financial statements, and the audit report. You can find figure 7-3 on page 201 of your textbook. Current files include all documentation applicable to the year under audit. There is one set of permanent files for the client and a set of current files for each year's audit. The types of information often included in the current file are the audit program, the working trial balance, the adjusting entries, and the supporting schedules prepared by the client or the auditor. The auditing standards require a written audit program for every audit. As the audit progresses, each auditor initials or electronically signs the program for the audit procedures performed and indicates the date of completion. Because the basis for preparing the financial statement is the general ledger, the amounts included in that record are the focal point of the audit. As early as possible after the balance sheet date, the auditor obtains or prepares a listing of the general ledger accounts and their year-end balances. This schedule is the working trial balance. Each line item on the trial balance is supported by a lead schedule containing the detailed accounts from the general ledger making up the line item total. Each detailed account on the lead schedule is in turn supported by proper schedules supporting the audit work performed and the conclusions reached. When the auditor discovers material misstatements in the accounting records, the financial statements must be corrected. For example, if the client failed to properly reduce inventory, the auditor can propose an adjusting entry to reflect 
the realizable value of the inventory. Even though adjusting entries discovered in the audit are often prepared by the auditor, they must be approved by the client because management has primary responsibility for the fair presentation of the statements. Only those adjusting entries that significantly affect the fair, the fair presentation of financial statements must be recorded. The largest portion of audit documentation includes the detailed supporting schedules prepared by the client or the auditors in support of specific amounts on the financial statements. The major types of supporting schedules are the analysis which show the activity in a general ledger account during the entire period under audit, the trial balance or lease that consists of the details that make up a year-end balance of a general ledger account, the reconciliation of amounts that supports a specific amount and is normally expected to tie the amount recorded in the client's records to another source of information. Uh, substantive analytical procedures discussed earlier, the summary of procedures that summarizes the results of a specific audit procedure, the examination of supporting documentation that document the tests performed and the results found, informational schedule that contain information such as tax return or time budgets as opposed to audit evidence, and lastly, outside documentation such as confirmation replies and copies of client agreements. In here, we have an illustration of the relationship of audit documentation to financial statements. This figure illustrates the adjusting entry of the general cash account for 90000 As discussed Earlier, adjusting entries are part of the current file for an audit. You can find figure 7 4 on page 203 of your textbook. In here, we have an example of a trial balance schedule or lease consisting of the details that make up a year end balance of a general ledger account. In this particular example, we have the details of the notes receivable account for Rinaldo Machine Company for the year ending 11-30-2016. Uh, this figure also illustrates the common characteristics of proper audit documentation, which we will be discussing on the next slide. Uh, you can find figure 7-5 on page 204 of your textbook. The proper preparation of schedules to document the audit evidence accumulated, the results found, and the conclusions reached is an important part of the audit. The documentation should be prepared in sufficient detail to provide a clear understanding of the work performed, evidence obtained, and its source, and the conclusions reached by the auditor. Now, audit documentation should possess the following characteristics. Each audit file should be properly identified with such information as the client's name, the period covered, a description of the contents, the initials of the preparer, the date of preparation, and an index code. And audit documentation should be indexed and cross-reference to aid in organizing and filing. Completed audit documentation must clearly indicate the audit work performed through a memorandum by initialing the audit procedures in the audit program and by notations directly on the schedules. Notations on schedules are accomplished by the use of tick marks. Tick marks are symbols adjacent to the detail on the body of the schedule. These notations must be clearly explained at the bottom of the schedule. Audit documentation should also include sufficient information to fulfill the audit objectives for which it was designed.
And lastly, the conclusions that were reached about the segment of the audit under consideration should be clearly stated. We have reached the end of the discussions for Chapter 7. In this chapter, we covered the types of audit evidence, analytical procedures, and audit documentation. Please complete the required evaluation method for Chapter 7 as it will be part of your final grade. The homework and quiz are to be submitted on the specified due date. Please use Blackboard and Persons MyLab to complete your homework and quiz. You have reached the end of the course presentation for Chapter 7. Please access the video for Chapter 8 for the next presentation of the course.